Amen and praise the Lord. It is so good to see you today at Quail Springs Baptist Church. I'm glad that God has brought you to this place. And I'm thankful that we can gather together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for people that God brings into our church each week. If you're here today and you're a first-time guest especially, we'd love to meet you right after services are over. In fact, I'll be out at our welcome desk in the archways for several minutes after services are over. I'd love to meet you personally, and we've got a gift that we'd love to give you today. I also want to take just a moment uh, to say how thankful I am to have a couple of, of, of folks who are here with us today. Jeff and Laura DiGiacomo are here today. Uh, you saw him baptized. They're here in our service along with their boys. Express your appreciation to the DiGiacomo family. We just love them. I'm looking forward to them. There they are. Okay. I'm so thankful that you guys are here today, and, uh, and Brother Jeff, man, we've been praying for you as you're leading there at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Shawnee. We've been lifting up your church, and we're lifting up the Shawnee community in these days, and for you as you minister and serve there in the wake of these tornadoes that came through and just all of the, all of the things that are involved in that. We thank God for you, brother. We love you. We miss you here, but we're thankful for how God is using you where you are. Thankful to have the DiGiacomos with us today. My mom and dad are here today from North Carolina somewhere. If they'll raise their hands, where are they? Can I see them? There they are. Right there they are. My mom and dad, Gerald and Selma Rummage, here from, um, here from Greensboro, North Carolina. They came in on uh, Friday, and they'll be with us until early morning on Tuesday. Just really thankful to have them here, and they said we want to go to all the services today. And uh, they, 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 they've been here once before, uh, and so most of you probably have not met them or seen them before, but they see you every week. They watch the 930 service every week. In fact, just to tell you the truth, Lance Gibson is sort of a, a celebrity in their eyes, so they're hoping that they can meet Lance while they're here. Lance, I hope you can make it to, to be able to say hello to my mom and dad. It means so much to my dad just to be able to say he shook your hand. Anyway, we're glad that we can be in the Lord's house together today. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and today I want to talk to you about servant leaders in the church. We're going through the book of 1 Timothy, and we're talking about what God says we should do in the household of God, how the household of God is to come together, what we are to do, what we are to be, how we are to operate. And today we're going to talk about the servant leaders that God gives in his household, in his church, and the different roles and the different qualities that God is looking for in those different areas of servanthood and leadership. So we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I heard a story about a woman who won an all-expenses-paid vacation to Europe. Everything was going to be first class. Her airline tickets across the Atlantic Ocean, first class. All of her accommodations, the hotels, first class. It's excursions every day, first class. Everything was going to be incredible. Great meals, everything taken care of, all expenses paid. And she got on the airplane, and they were flying over the Atlantic Ocean. She had a great seat there in first class. She'd never sat there before. It was so wonderful. They were taking good care of her. And then one of the flight attendants became ill on the, the trip over, and she was not able to serve. And, and they were having a hard time getting all the meals served and other things done. And so this woman who had won the trip stood up and went up to the little area and stopped and talked to the head flight attendant and said, I will be glad to help serve the meals. And I know you need help, and I know you're shorthanded. I, I'm, I can help. I would be glad to serve the meals. And the head flight attendant said, no, ma'am, we, we don't, that, that's highly unusual. We just never have done that. I don't think we can do that. And plus, you're supposed to be seated in first class. We're supposed to be serving you. And the woman said, listen, I've received this whole trip for free. The least I can do on my way is serve. Well, for those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that story resonates because, listen, through his blood and through his grace, Jesus has provided every spiritual blessing of heaven for us. We've been promised a home in heaven when we die to be with him forever and ever. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us now so that we can become more and more of what he wants us to be. He has blessed us in every way. He's given us a first class ticket for all of eternity. And the least we can do along the way 
is to say, Lord Jesus, I will serve. I'll look for opportunities to serve. And one of the ways that God works in the church of Jesus Christ is to give us those opportunities to serve. Now, there are those who serve by leading. There are those who lead by serving. But there are all kinds of leadership and servanthood roles that God gives his people in his church. And that's what the word of God addresses in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I want you to stand with me as we read God's word together. We're going to begin by reading verses 14 and 15 of this chapter. Now these two verses are really, I believe, central for this chapter. And more than that, they're central to the entire book of 1 Timothy. So we've looked at these before, but today they're part of our text. And so I want us to begin there as we read, beginning in verse 14. Paul writes to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This is the word of God. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, we love you. We praise you. I thank you for this good day that you've given us. Lord, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to hear, to know, to understand your word. And Lord Jesus, show us what it means to serve you, what it means to follow you in your church. And we'll give you glory and honor, Lord, for all that you do. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And brothers and sisters, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Look again at the words in verse 15 of our text. Paul says, I'm writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church. Paul says, I'm writing this to you so you'll know how to behave in church. When I read that, I thought that, that sounds like mama language. How to behave in church. Do you remember your mama telling you how to behave in church? I can remember my mother teaching me when I was a little boy, probably uh, coming out of kindergarten, going into first grade somewhere along there, how to behave in church. And you may have been taught things like when you come to church, make sure you, you take your seat and, and stand up at the right time and sit down at the right time, so it's, but sit still when you're in church. Or you may have been told, don't run up and down the aisles because you're in church and you don't run in church. And pay attention if you're in church. And if you can't pay attention in church, here's a pen and here's the church bulletin. Fill in every B and every D and every O. And just, and just that'll give you something to do. In church, I don't know what you may have been told about behaving in church. It's good to teach our kids how to behave in church. But here in this text, the Word of God is not talking about how kids are to behave in church. It talks about how God's people, those whom God has entrusted different responsibilities, how we are to behave in the church. And so as we look at this text of Scripture, the Word of God identifies three different Areas. First of all, it talks about the qualities of the pastor who oversees the church. It talks about the qualities of the deacons who serve the church. And then finally, it talks about the qualities of the Lord who rules the church. Beginning in verse 1, the Bible talks about the qualities of the pastor who oversees the church. Now look in verse 1 right at the beginning of that verse. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So Paul begins this chapter of teaching by saying, if someone aspires to or sets his heart on the office of overseer, that is a noble task that he desires. The word that the Bible uses here to describe the leader of the church is over. Seer. That, that's an unusual word for us. If you have the King James Version Bible or the New King James, it actually uses the word bishop. And, and we, we don't use that word at all in our Baptist life, or not, at least not much at all. And yet the word here for overseer is the word from which bishop comes. It's the Greek word episkopos. And the word episkopos literally means to see over or to look over. It has the root word skopos and then the prefix Epi. Epi means 
over and skapos means to see. That word skapos comes into our language in a variety of words. If you want to see something very small, you use a micro skapos. Or if you want to see something very far away, you use a telescopos, a telescope or a microscope. Well, here the word is used talking about the spiritual leader of the church, and it describes him as the episkopos, the over. Seer. There are three New Testament words that are used interchangeably to describe the same person and the same office in the church. Sometimes this role is called the overseer. Most often this role is called the elder. Sometimes this role is called the pastor. Usually we use the term pastor in the New Testament. Those three terms are used interchangeably. And I'm just going to walk you through some passages of Scripture in the New Testament to show you how those three words operate together. Look in your Bible in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Titus is very much like the book of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy in that Paul was writing to Titus to tell him how to lead in the church. And here's what he says in verse 5 of Titus chapter 1. This is why I left you in Crete, Uh, Titus was on the island of Crete. Timothy was serving over in Ephesus. But he says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders, presbyteros, elders in every town as I directed you. So here the spiritual leader is called an elder, a presbyteros. We get our word presbyterian uh, from that word. And the word presbyteros or elder refers to the respect and the leadership given to to the elder. uh, That you appoint elders in every town. And then look in verse 7. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. And so in verse 5, he's talking about elders He uses the word elders. In verse 7, he uses the word overseer. And it's very clear from context, he's talking about the same person, the same office in the church. Now take your Bibles and turn a few pages back to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And we're just letting the Bible speak to us about these three words, overseer, pastor, and elder. In Acts chapter 20, verse 17... The Bible describes something that happened with uh, the elders in Ephesus, the very area where Timothy was serving when Paul wrote 1 Timothy. Look in verse 17. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders, the presbyteroi, the, the, the presbyters of the church to come to him. So he calls the elders out to him. Then look down in verse 28. As he speaks to them and gives them instructions, he tells these elders this. Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock. Notice that shepherd imagery there, talking about a shepherd and his sheep. The word for shepherd or pastor, that's the same word. Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you, there it is, overseers to care for, and the word care for means to shepherd or to pastor for the church of God, which he has obtained with his own blood. So we see in this passage, the same group of people are called elders, overseers, and pastors. Take a look in your Bible now in the book of 1 Peter. If you'll look there in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, just one more passage to show you. And here, all three words right together describing the same office. Look in verse Uh, verses 1 and 2 of 1 Peter chapter 5. And there Peter writes this, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd or pastor the flock of God that is among you exercising oversight. And there's the word for uh, bishop or overseer of the church. All three terms refer to the same office in the church, and they reveal different aspects of that office of leadership. As the pastor, the spiritual leader of the church is given the care of the church, and specifically to care by teaching the Word of God to the church. In the book of Ephesians, when it describes the pastor, it calls him the pastor teacher, and so the the, the leader of the church pastors. He teaches and cares for the church. As the overseer, he gives direction and vision and guidance to the church. As the elder, he is uh, given respect and leadership in the church. And so all of those words describe the same office. Now back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
The Bible says the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. And from there, the Bible begins to list the qualities of the pastor who oversees the church. And as you go through, you'll notice there are 15 qualities that the Word of God uh, lists in this text. I'm just going to walk us through each one, beginning in verse 2. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. That's the first quality. He is to be above reproach. That word in the original language was used in the language of wrestling to describe a wrestler that his opponent couldn't get a hold of. And so to be above reproach means that the adversary, the devil, can't get a hold of this overseer. It means that he, he doesn't live a perfect life, but he does live a lot because nobody can live a perfect life. If perfection was the requirement, nobody would be would be, would be uh, qualified. And yet the Bible says that the overseer is to be above reproach. Satan does not gain a foothold in his life. He's living a life that is honoring to God. And then the next quality, he is to be the husband of one wife. Literally the text in the original language says he is a man of one woman, a one woman kind of man. That means he is to be faithful to his wife. That means he's not to have a roving eye or to be a flirt or a philanderer. I believe the safest interpretation of this text would mean that he remains married to the first wife, the wife of his youth. He is the husband of one wife. That's the next quality. The next quality is he is sober-minded. The word sober-minded there means that he has a calm and accurate understanding of what's going on around him. When all kinds of things are swirling around him because his mind is set on what God has for the church and what God has for him and what God has for the world, he is sober-minded. Not only sober-minded, next, he is self-controlled. In the Word of God, when the Bible describes someone who is self-controlled, it's describing almost always someone who allows his self to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. It's another word for being spirit-filled or spirit-controlled. He is self-controlled. His self is under control of the Holy Spirit. He is respectable. That means that he can deal with all kinds of different people, with kindness and with dignity. He is to be hospitable as the, the shepherd or the overseer of the church. He's to welcome those who come and to have a friendly disposition and to open wide the arms of the church to those who God brings to the church. He is hospitable, not only at the church, but in his personal life as well. And then next, the Bible says in verse 2, he is able to to teach. Now, you might want to just underline that phrase because it's, it's different than almost all the other qualities that are listed here. Just about every other quality listed for the overseer could be applied to any Christian in the church. But one of the specific specialized qualities that the overseer is to have is the ability to teach. That means he has the ability to understand God's Word. He trains himself so that he can interpret God's Word correctly. And then he works and has the gifts to be able to communicate God's Word. He is able to teach. Continuing into verse 3. He is not a drunkard. Literally, he is not given to wine or not addicted to wine. Alcohol does not have a foothold in his life. I believe that the safest understanding of this, especially in my practice, in my life, is that I, I abstain totally from alcoholic beverages as a spiritual leader in the church. He's not a drunkard. He's not violent. Literally, the word there uh, means he is not a striker. He, he doesn't strike out at someone in anger, either with his words or with his hands. He's not violent. Instead, here's the next quality. He is gentle. He is kind and compassionate to the people around him. Next, he is not quarrelsome. He's not always trying to, to win an argument with someone. He doesn't always have to get his own way. He doesn't always have to prove himself right. He's not quarrelsome. He is not a lover of money. Uh, materialism, money and the things that money can buy are not the highest priorities in his life. And then the next quality. Is everybody with me so, so far? Say amen if you are. I'm not just up here talking about myself. I'm talking about qualities that the church should look for in their spiritual leaders and also qualities that God has for all of us as we seek to follow Jesus. He must, look in verse 4, he must manage his own household well. Now, the phrase household means his 
family. And, and if you notice, and it's, it strikes me that of all of the, the qualities listed here, the one that Paul elaborates on most is how the pastor manages his own household. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? I say it without apology. I say it without blushing. I say it without stammering or stuttering. My wife and my family are the number one priorities in my life for you as your pastor. This church is not my priority. My relationship with Jesus Christ is my number one priority. And then my relationship with my wife and my family. And then if those things are taken care of, then the other things will fall in place as I seek God's purpose for my life as your pastor. And then the Bible gives one other thing, verse 7. Oh, no, 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 verse 6. Here's, we've got two more things. Number 6, he must not be a recent convert. Along with being able to teach, this is a unique qualification for the pastor. He must not be a recent convert. Not, no matter how gifted he is, no matter how good he may be or, or attractive he may be, if he has just recently come to faith in Jesus Christ, he's not ready to oversee God's church. And here's why. It says he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. The phrase puffed up there means literally to have your head in the clouds. He may get his head in the clouds with his own giftedness and fall into the same prideful condemnation as the devil. And then last, number seven, verse seven. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. He must be well thought of by those outside the church. Those who are not saved should see that this is a man who walks with the Lord. That means he's not just a godly man when he's in the pulpit, not just a godly man when he's on the church campus or, or among the church people, but when he's at the ball game, when somebody cuts him off in traffic and on the highway, when, I'm, by the way, I'm not describing my week from this past week, when, 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 he's, when he's in the grocery store, wherever he is, wherever he is, he seeks to be someone who can be well thought of as someone who follows the Lord and represents him well. Those are the qualities the Bible lists for the pastor. Now, here's what I want you to see. Don't miss this. Almost all of these qualities, all but one, all but able to teach, every quality here describes not the pastor's skill set, but his character. Not what he's able to do, but who he is. So many times in the church, we become impressed with giftedness and attractiveness, whereas God is most interested in faithfulness and integrity. If the man will take care of who he is, God will take care of what he does. And you know, I've seen that in my own life. I remember when I began serving as a pastor. In fact, I hadn't even begun serving. I just knew that God had called me to be a pastor. I desire, I, I aspire to the office of overseers, the Bible says here in verse one. I knew that God had called me to be a pastor. And I was in my first day at, on, on the campus as a seminary student because I knew that being a pastor and being called to be a pastor, first of all, began by being trained in the Word of God. And so I immediately went to seminary, and I was there on the first day. And, and I, I got there, and I was 22 years old. And I got there on that campus, and I looked around, and I thought, man, I, I don't look like these other guys who are pastors. I don't don't look like them. I don't talk like them. I don't come from the same kinds of backgrounds as as they do. And I remember the first day of class, there there was a guy. We had a big assembly time. There was a guy. He he had been a pastor, and he was there at seminary too, but he had been a pastor for a couple of years. And, man, he looked like what we thought a pastor looked like. He had on the right clothes. He had his hair all going straight back. You know, pastors used to wear all their hair straight. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Combed straight back, every hair in place. And he was there. He was just a student like I was, but he was greeting people, greeting other students as though he were the pastor of the church. And he saw me. He shook my hand. He said, how are you doing, brother? I know you. What's your name? And I said, it's Stephen Rummage. He said, that's exactly right. And I was proud I got it right. I mean, he was just really, really good at doing stuff like that. Man, I, I, I heard him. And I saw other people like that. Went back to my little dorm room and just prayed to God. 
I can't get my hair to do like that. And I don't have a personality like that. I don't have whatever I thought the stereotypical pastor personality was. I don't have that. I don't know if I have this skill set. I'm I'm pretty soft-spoken personally and a little nervous about being in front of people. I'm not messing with you. I'm soft-spoken and nervous sometimes talking in front of people. And I say, Lord, I don't know that I've got the skill set for this. And he just said to me, Stephen, I've called you. And I knew who you were when I called you. And so I will use you. And I will make you what I need you to be. So that you can do what I need you to do. Man, that was true in my life. Can I tell you something? Same thing's true in your life. You say, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm not saying you're a pastor. I'm saying if God has placed his purpose on your life, and he has, every Christian here, he's put a purpose on your life to serve him, for him to use you. And he will use you as you simply give yourself to him and allow him to use you. And so the Bible describes the qualities of the pastor who oversees The church, I want to tell you, I'm thankful to God to be a pastor. And I'm thankful to God for other ministers on our staff who gather around me and come alongside of me and provide wisdom and direction and and who serve with expertise in areas where where I couldn't serve or where I don't have expertise. And and I just thank God for them. But the Bible describes the, the qualifications of the pastor who oversees the church. Then moving on to the second section, beginning in verse 8, the Bible describes the qualities of the deacons who serve the church. The deacons who serve the church. Verse 8, deacons likewise must be dignified. I want to stop right here. Deacons likewise. The, The word deacon in the original language literally means through the dust. It's a two part word. The prefix dia which means through, and then the, the root word kanos, which means dust, through the du- dust, diakonos, deacon. It means through the dust. Outside of the New Testament, the word diakonos was used to describe a table waiter who was running back and forth from the kitchen to the table, kicking up dust, just running through the dust, back and forth, serving. Deacons lead by serving. And, and the Bible begins to describe the deacons in the church and what they are to be. Look at what it says. Deacons must be dignified. The word dignified there simply means serious-minded. Deacons, that doesn't mean they don't have a sense of humor, but it does mean they're serious about the church, and they're serious about their faith, and they're serious about the calling that God has placed on their life. They must be dignified. And then they must not be double-tongued. That means they don't say one thing to one group to please them and then another thing to another group to please them. And then I'll tell this group this, and I'll tell this group that, and I'll just keep everybody on my team. No, they're not double-tongued that way. They speak the truth to everyone. They are not addicted to much wine. That's the next qualification. That's the same uh, that's given at, for the pastor. They are not greedy for dishonest gain. Again, the uh, same thing is given for the pastor or overseer. Look in verse 9. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, the pastor is required to be able to teach. The deacon doesn't have to be able to teach, but it does say, while the deacon may not be a teacher, he must be a student of the Word of God. He must be a learner. He must hold on to or grasp the mystery of the faith, the things that were once Unknown. The word mystery there means that which once was hidden but now has been revealed through Jesus Christ. They must hold on to the mystery of their faith in Jesus Christ. They must grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ with a clear conscience. In other words, they should be growing in their understanding of who Jesus is and what God's Word teaches. And they must be doing that with a clear conscience, living and walking in a way that pleases God. The next quality for a deacon. By the way, there, there, there are seven different qualities listed here in verses uh, 8 through 10. The next quality is this. Let them be tested first. The deacon is to be tested by the church. 
In other words, the, the church should look at this, this man and see in him the qualities and the character that will serve him well as a deacon. Let them, as a deacon. Let them be tested first. Then, here's the next quality, then let them serve as deacons if they pl- prove themselves blameless. The Bible says the deacon is to be blameless. It's very close to the word used for the pastor where it says he's to be above Reproach. Now, the deacon is not to be sinless, otherwise no one would be qualified. But he is to be blameless. In other words, when he messes up, he confesses and forsakes that sin and, and gets things right. He asks for forgiveness where he needs to so that he can be blameless. And then after giving those seven qualities for the deacon, beginning in verse 11, Paul lists four qualities for the deacon's wife. That's because the, the deacon and his wife are partners together in ministry. Verse 11, their wives likewise must be dignified. Just as the deacon is to be serious-minded, so is his wife. Not slanderers. The word for slanderer there is the word diabolos. We get our word diabolical, and even the the, the word for devil in in the New Testament is the word diabolos. And and the word slanderer, uh, that's what the word devil means, is a slanderer. The, 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 The deacon's wife is not to be someone who speaks ill of other people. Or who gossips about other people. She's not to be a slanderer. Instead, she's to be sober-minded. The same qualification that's given for the pastor there in verse 2 is given for the deacon's wife there. She's to be someone who brings a calm, reasonable, uh, 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 calm and reasonable presence to any conversation she enters. And so there the Bible describes uh, the deacon's wife. One other word, she is to be faithful in all things. In everything, she's to be a woman of faith and faithfulness. And so four qualities given for the deacon's wives. And then the Bible picks up with two more qualities for deacons. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife. In other words, he's to be a man of one woman, a one-woman kind of man, just as uh, the pastor or the overseer is to be. And then also, just like the pastor, he is to manage the children well, managing their children well and their own households Well, he should be a leader in his home, setting a good example there. Now look in verse 13. Everybody with me? Say amen. 13. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Sometimes the role of the diakonos, the one going through the dust, sometimes that's that's a, a role in the background. It may not have the same attention as other roles. And yet the Bible says that Jesus is paying attention. That when you serve well in that role as a deacon or as a deacon's wife, you gain a good standing for yourself and also great confidence in your faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so he talks about the qualities of the deacons who serve the church. Can I just take a moment and tell you how thankful to God I am for the deacons and their wives who serve our church here at Quell Springs Baptist Church. I praise God for our deacons. They're godly people. They pray for me. They love our staff. They love our church. They love the Lord. They're always looking for ways to serve. They're not church bosses. They're not a board of directors. They are a group of servants before the Lord who love to serve. And I thank God for them. Throughout my ministry, I've been blessed at every every stage with godly deacons who have loved me and prayed for me and helped the church. The second church I ever pastored, I was 25 years old when I became the pastor of that church. And it was in Covington, Louisiana, Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. It was a church that maybe had 70 people in attendance on most Sundays. And I got there and I met Brother Hezzy, Hezzy Sharp. And he introduced himself to me this way. He said, Brother Stephen, he said, I'm Hezzy Sharp. I'm the onlyest deacon at this church. And he was right. He was the onlyest deacon at that church. They just had one deacon, Brother Hez. He was retired from working in, in custodial work at, at one of the school systems in our area, and he was our only deacon at that church. We would have meetings together. Deacons means the decisions were always unanimous. <laughs> it was just Hez. And, uh, and he loved me. He, he told me, he said, he said Brother Stephen, I, I wake up every, every morning at 3 a.m. to take a pill and he said, I sit down in my chair my, every morning at 3 a.m. And I pray for you every morning at 3 a.m. I love Brother Hezzy. And after we had been there at that church, maybe six months, maybe a year, we, uh, we, we knew we needed to get some other deacons. 
uh, we need somebody to help Brother Hezzy. And there were some other men in the church, younger men, who really were already doing a lot of the ministry that a deacon might do. And so we ordained three other men to serve as deacons, Charlie and Keith and Sherman, and then Brother Hezzy continued on. And, and so we had our first deacons meeting with our newly minted deacons. And Brother Charlie uh, was there, and, and, and I, he said, well, Pastor, what do we need to do? He said, we're, we're new deacons. What do we need to do? I said, well, I think the first thing you need to do is sort of organize yourselves. And he said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, I think probably you ought to have a deacon chairman and then sort of organize your work. And, uh, and Charlie said, well, Pastor, since we're all new at this, Maybe you could be the chairman of the deacons. <laughs> now, friend, if you're the pastor of the church and the chairman of the deacons at a Baptist church, that's the whole ball of string right there. <laughs> I was tempted, but I'm not ordained as a deacon. So I had to tell him, uh, Brother Charlie, I can't be chairman of the deacons. I'll be the pastor. Somebody else needs to be the chairman of the deacons. And they got somebody to be the chairman of the deacons. I think it was Brother Charlie. And they served the Lord so well. God uses servant leaders. By the way, before I go on to my next thing, I want you to see something. Both the word overseer and the word deacon, both the word episkopos and diakonos, both of those words were used to describe servants. A deacon was a servant who ran back and forth taking care of the tables. Uh, an, an overseer was a servant who made sure that the work was getting done the way it needed to be done. But both were servants. And so pastors and deacons together are serving the Lord in the church. I want you to see one other thing in this te text. I want you to think with me about the qualities of the Lord who rules the church. The pastor leads the church. The pastor does not rule the church. It's not his church. The deacons serve the church. The deacons do not rule the church. It's not their church. The congregation is the church. The congregation does not rule the church. After all, it's not our church. The church has one ruler, and his name is Jesus. And the Bible begins to describe him and what he does in the church, beginning in verse 14. Notice the words of God, the words of these verses as God speaks to us again here. Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay... You may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And then he begins to describe the qualities of the Lord Jesus who rules the church. One thing the Bible shows us is that Jesus bonds the church together. The church is described as the household of God. We're not just a random group of people who get together on Sunday morning. We're not just an organization that's recognized as an incorporated group. We are the family of God. We are the household of God. We are bonded together by Jesus Christ as his church at Quail Springs Baptist Church. He bonds us together. But then also the Bible says he beckons us to himself. Notice what it says. How one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. I've circled in my Bible that word church just to remind me that the church has been beckoned out from the world. The word church literally in the Greek language is the word ekklesia. It means called out. We've been called out. We've been called out of our sin and beckoned to Christ. We've been called out from the world and beckoned into the body of Christ. He bonds the church together. He beckons us to himself. And then the Bible says he builds us. Notice what the Bible says as we continue. The church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Jesus builds us. A pillar or a buttress starts on earth and reaches its way into heaven. In the same way, Jesus Christ is building us up. He is building up his church on earth so that we can become more and more and more and more of that pillar and buttress of truth, leading people to heaven and becoming more heavenly minded and heavenly useful in our own lives. He builds his church. And then notice the Bible says that Jesus, the ruler of the church, blesses the church. Look in verse 16. Great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. Paul says the, 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 the relationship we have with God and the mystery of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. 
is such an incredible truth. He says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. And then he begins to quote from a song. It may have been a song that he wrote himself. It may have been a song that, that, that someone else wrote, and Paul is quoting it here. But it was a song that the people in the church in Ephesus would have known. We know the words of the song. Timothy probably was humming along to the melody of the song as he read those words. It just reminded him of that song. He may have been singing it. We don't know the melody, but, but they would have known. Listen to what it says about how Jesus blesses the church. It shows Jesus blesses the church through his birth. He was manifested in the flesh. The eternal word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. He blesses us in his birth. He blesses us in his death and resurrection. The Bible describes Jesus by saying he was vindicated by the spirit and seen by angels. When Jesus died on the cross and laid his body down in death, he was in that tomb. And on the third day, he came out. And the Bible says he was proven to be the son of God by the spirit of God with power. He was vindicated. He was shown to be who he said he was by the spirit. And he was seen by the angels and they proclaimed the message. He is not here for he is risen. He blesses the church through his death and resurrection. He blesses the church through his gospel. He is proclaimed among the nations and believed on in the world. It's a reminder to us that as the church, our purpose is to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ that the world might believe. And then he blesses the church through his ascension. He's been taken up into glory. And praise God, right now, he is present as our ascended Lord in power in his church and he's working in his church that his church might glorify his name. When Jesus is the ruler of the church, he brings everything together. Man, what gives a church unity? People have strange ideas about what they think will bring a church unity. I heard someone say one time, not here, someone said to me, you know, a church has unity when everybody can debate everything and vote on everything. And I thought, well, if that's true, then every homeowner's association in the state of Oklahoma would have perfect unity. That's not what brings unity. Unity comes when Jesus Christ is ruling in the heart and life of the pastor and the deacons and the saints in the church, ruling in each of our lives individually so that when we come together, we gather around him and he gives us unity and he gives us harmony. I've been told by, by a music teacher that it's nearly impossible to take one piano and to tune it to another piano. If you just take those two pianos and try to tune them to one another, so many strings and so many things and so many variables, it's almost impossible to tune one piano to another. But if you'll tune this piano to one tuning fork and then you tune the other piano to the same tuning fork, They'll be in tune with one another because they're both in tune with that tuning fork. Same thing with instruments in the orchestra with different ranges and pitches and timbres and sound. When they're all tuned to the same source, they're all in tune with one another. Our church has all kinds of different people. We come from different backgrounds. We have black people, white people, other races in our church. We have people from different educational backgrounds, some people with great extensive education, some people with, with just basic educations, some people still getting their educations, all part of this church. We, we have people from all kinds of financial backgrounds, some with a lot of resources, some without much at all. We have people from different places, some people from, from here and other people from other places. We have people that think different things about politics and the world and how things ought to be. None of those things are where our unity comes from. Our unity comes by being tuned to one source, the ruler of the church, and his name is Jesus. And when he is ruling and reigning, then leaders will lead where they should lead, and servants will serve as they should serve, and the work of the church will go where he wants it to go. I praise God that we can be part of his church because he promises that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Nothing can stop his church. 